Excellent. Hence that which first presents itself to our view, because it is form and a spectacle of intellect, is by this means lovely and pleasant to the sight. Uh, on, on this account, Plato wishing to uh, intimate to us this truth represents the demiurgos of the universe approving his own perfect work, willing from hence to exhibit by something more manifest to our apprehension the beauty of the exemplar or the demiur or the paradigm. And of this great idea, ah, it's perfectly lovely. For as often as one admires a work fabricated according to an exemplar, he must particularly admire the exemplar according to the exemplar. He must be particularly admire the exemplar itself, nor ought it to, to seem wonderful if in the meantime such a one is ignorant of what he suffers, since uh, terrain lovers and those who admire corporeal beauty are ignorant that they are thus affected on account of supernal beauty. But that Plato refers to the Demiurgos of the universe loving his work to the divine exemplar is evident from hence. For he says he was delighted with his work and wished to render it even more similar to the exemplar or paradigm. Evincing from this the beauty of the exemplar. For he says it's a work, that its work is beautiful and hence it is an image of its artificer. For indeed, unless that was inestimably beautiful, what would be more beautiful than this universe, which is the object, or the, which is the subject of our corporeal sight? Now, on which account do they perceive rightly who detract from beauty? Now, now. This is the paragraph I wanted to get into now. Let us then receive by cogitation this our sensible world. So dispose that every part may remain indeed what it is, but that one thing may mutually reside in another. So here comes his meditation. Let us suppose that all things are collected as much as possible into one, so that each particular object may first present, it, pre present itself to the eyes as if a sphere should be the exterior boundary, the spectacle of the sun immediately succeeding, and an image of the other stars and the earth and the sea and all the animals should appear within in a diaphanous globe Lastly, let us conceive that it is possible to behold all things in each. Let there be then in the soul a lucid imagination of a sphere containing all things in its transparent receptacle, whether they are agitated or at rest or partly mutable and partly stable. Now preserving this sphere, receive another into your soul removing from this last the extension into bulk. Take away, likewise, place, banish far from yourself all imagination of matter. At the same time, being careful not to conceive the second sphere as something less than the first in bulk. Uh, for this must be a void of all dimension. After this, invoke the divinity who is the author of the universe. Imagined in your fantasy and earnestly entreat him to approach. Then will be, then he suddenly, uh, then will he suddenly come, bearing with him his own divine world, with all the gods it contains. Then will he come, being at the same time one and all, and bringing with him all things concurring in one. There indeed all the gods, all the various amongst themselves in gradations of power, yet by that one abundant power that they're all but one, or rather one and all. For the divinity never fails but uh, which they are all produced. But all the gods abide together and each is again separate 
from the other in certain states, unattended with distance, and bearing no form subject to sensible inspection. This entire paragraph is a meditation. <laughs> it's all this metaphysics you're supposed to visualize it in your mind. Hmm. I'm skipping a sentence. But this divine world is so truly great that its parts become infinite. For where can anything be said to exist with uh, which is not extended? The sensible world, oh, it's, it's great. And all powers are contained in it as ample bosom. But it would be much greater, and that in a manner perfectly ineffable, if it were free from the diminutive power of a, a body. And if it should be said that the power of fire and other bodies is great, it must be remembered that true powers are infinite. And that this is only from the ignorance of these that corporeal natures appear to be, to have being, and to operate by corrupting, separating, ministering, Oh. I'm going to skip to his uh, a sentence to to get to a conclusion. Um, but the power which flourishes there, see, in the sphere, possesses being alone, and is alone beautiful without any external or adventitious qualities, which can only degrade from the, from the dignity of essence. For where can there be anything beautiful deprived of being? And where can essence abide if it wants the presence of beauty? For while beauty is taken away, essence is destroyed. Under this account, being itself is desirable because being and beauty are the same. And the beautiful is lovely because it's being. But it's not proper to inquire which is the cause of the other, since the nature of each is one and the same. The false essence is indeed of bodies require a certain image of beauty, and you know, extrinsically acceding. Both that they may appear beautiful and that they may inherit an obscure portion of being. Ah. So he ends with uh, his metaphysics, right? <laughs> so he's asking to imagine his entire metaphysics. Right, just imagine them. Well, and then he's going to address the issue of beauty throughout. And then his conclusion is interesting, isn't it? Beauty is equivalent to the being. Fine. They're one and the same. That's just metaphysics. That's just metaphysics. And you to visualize this in your mind. And from this point, he goes into different Greek gods. All right, take a look. What do you think? It's a meditation, isn't it? Right. Right. It starts with a minute, build the whole thing, a sphere. Right. Then you become it. So this guy is very interesting. He he builds a meditation. Right.
Right, if you contemplate it, right, to uh, and uh, to uh, uh, nourish the possibility of the experience. Then he takes his metaphysics, right? He takes all his metaphysics. One, uh, unity, five, etc. Being, intellect, demiurgos, or God the creator. And then focuses on the theme of beauty, builds that, and then comes to its conclusion. Very nice, isn't it? Mm -hmm. See, he's not just thinking by himself and working through categories in order to build a logical metaphysics. He's building an object of meditation, a contemplative, right, to prepare the mind for vision. Then, he can show how all of the metaphysical ideas interrelate. And then he comes back with a nice conclusion, right? Hey. Beauty itself? Hey. Pure being. Oh, by the way, they're one and the same. So, with Plotinus, do it, get the experience. Then you build your metaphysics out of your experience, not just out of ideas and the logical consequences of certain sets of ideas. Look what he's doing now. Just to get someone else to read, I think would have more fun. Um, now he's going to put it into the heavens. I sh I'd like to skip that paragraph, but it's rather nice. What page? Uh, what page? 184. Okay. On the top of 184. Mm -hmm. Well, I'd like to get to the second paragraph, these divine objects, therefore, Zeus or Jupiter. But we got time, right, Stanley? Yeah, we can get someone to read. Who do you think, who do you think we should get to read? I, I think... Uh, Daniel, Daniel? Did you volunteer? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Where do okay. you want me to start reading? On this account, Zeus or Jupiter? Okay, I'm not, I'm not there yet. Um, okay. What page is that? 184. The third line. Okay, yeah, I was stuck way He squeezed the whole book in this machine. <laughs> on this account, Zeus himself, who is the most ancient of the other gods which he leads, proceeds oh, first. Oh, is that the one you want? Yeah. 184. Yeah. Right there. The top, up here at the top. Oh. Yeah, do it over. On this account, Zeus himself, who is the most ancient of the other gods, which he leads, proceeds first to the contemplation of the intelligible world. But afterwards, the subordinate gods, daemons, and souls follow him, who are able to perceive such transcendently lucid objects. And this divine world shines upon them. This is just the Phaedrus, right? Uh, and this divine world shines upon him from a certain occult place, which is no other than the abode of ineffable unity. But it illustrates all the divinities with its light and excites to itself superior souls who are afterwards converted to its splendid vision, which before they were incapable of perceiving and which, like the sun, dazzles the eye unaccustomed to intellectual light. 
and while some with elevated eyes easily bear its intuition, others who are more distant from its nature are disturbed with the vision. But since each of these blessed inhabitants perceives according to his ability, all of them indeed behold this intelligible world and its various contents, yet they do not all retain the same spectacle. But while they are lost in attentive vision, one beholds the lucid fountain and nature of the just itself, while another abundantly perceives temperance itself, but not such as that which resides with men when they enjoy its possession. For this our temperance imitates the supreme, but that diffusing itself in all things as if about all the magnitude of its nature is finally perceived by those who have already beheld many perspicuous spectacles. On this account, the gods behold everything separate, and at the same time, all things together. They perceive two divine souls there, whose vision is universal, and their nature becomes such from unbounded perception that they contain all things from the beginning to the end. Those divine That's objects... Nice. Hold on, hold on. Okay, okay. Well, just the first uh, two sentences over. On this account, Zeus himself, who is the most ancient of the other gods which he leads, and he's going to contemplate the intelligible world of God, proceeds first to the contemplation of the intelligible world, but afterwards, the subordinate gods, daemons, and souls follow him, who are able to perceive such transcendently lucid objects. Mm -hmm. And there, the... Uh Superior souls are then brought into this experience of divine luminosity, right? Or light. Go, go, go. Okay, for the next one, that's a good thing. Next one is I wanted to get into. Okay, jump in. The next paragraph? Yeah, yeah. Okay. These divine objects, therefore, Zeus himself and those of us who, together with Zeus, love this intelligible world, happily contemplate, together with that universal beauty shining from all. Right, there's a universal beauty. Shining throughout the whole thing. Yeah, go ahead. And whatever participates of the beauty which there abides. For everything there glitters and illuminates the spectators with its light. So what they become so that they become beautiful by its luster. Right, by its luster they become beautiful. Right. So now the beauty is now descended to gods, daemons, and souls. Go ahead just as it happens to those who ascend the highest mountains, where the earth is yellow, for they are immediately infected with the color and become similar to the earth to which they ascend. But the color which flourishes in the divine world is beauty itself. That's right. That's the color. This is beauty itself. Right. Mm-hmm. Ahead. Or rather, everything there is holy color and profound beauty. For beauty there is not like that which flourishes in the superficies of bodies, but among those who do not perceive the whole, that alone which is resplendent in the superficies is considered as beauty. But those who are totally filled with the intoxicating nectar of divine contemplation, since beauty diffuses itself through every part of their souls, do not become spectators alone. For in this case, the spectator is no longer external to the spectacle, but he who acutely perceives 
contains the object of his perception in the depth of his own essence. Right. So when they do see intuition, right, when they do see those, they encounter it in the depth of their own being. Good stuff. Yeah, go ahead. For he who beholds anything as external beholds it as something visible. And because he wishes to perceive it attended with distance. But whatever is beheld as perceptible is beheld externally. But it is requisite we should transfer the divine spectacle into ourselves and behold it as one. And as the same with our essence, just as if anyone hurried away by the vigorous impulse of some god, whether Apollo or one of the muses, should procure in himself the intuition of the god, since in the secret recesses of his own essence he will behold the divinity himself. But if any one of us who is not able to perceive himself entirely comprehended by this divinity should produce a spectacle into his view, for the purpose of assisting his vision, he should produce himself. Mm -hmm. And he will then perceive an image of the intelligible world, now become more beautiful and divine. But afterwards, neglecting the image, although beautiful, and conspiring with himself into one, and no longer separating his essence, he will become one all, together with that deity, who silently flows into his soul, and he will be present with him as far as he is able and as much as he desires. But if he should return from this divine union into two, and is in the meantime pure, he will nevertheless dwell proximate to its essence, so that by conversion he may again be present and become united with his divinity. But the gain of the soul will consist in this ineffable conversion. Indeed, when, it's, when it first attempts this union, it perceives itself, as long as it is different from the God. But when it has penetrated into its most intimate recesses, it will then find itself in possession of the intelligible universe. And casting sense behind, fearing lest it should become different, it will be one with this divine world. And if it desires to perceive as something different, it will place itself external to its object. Okay, now that he slips into a kind of contemplation, watch the language. <clears throat> but it is requisite that the soul which is about to perceive a divinity of this kind should possess a certain figure of his nature and assiduously persevere while it endeavors perspicuously to know him and thus, well understanding the importance of its pursuit, and trusting it is about to enter on the most blessed vision, should profoundly merge itself in contemplation, till instead of a spectator, it may become another specimen of the object of its intuition, such as it came from thence, abundantly shining with intellectual conceptions. But how can anyone reside in the beautiful itself unless he perceives it? Indeed, if he perceives it as something different, he will not as yet abide in beauty. But becoming beautiful, he will thus especially exist in beauty. If then vision is directed to something external, it is not proper that vision should be there. Or if it is, it should become one with the object of perception. But a doubt of this kind is like a certain consciousness of someone fearing, lest if he wished to perceive more vehemently, he should depart from himself. For thus disease more vehemently impels and excites our sensation, but health dwelling with us more quietly exhibits a truer knowledge of itself since it is present with silence and tranquility as something familiar and allied to us, and conspires into one with our composition. 
On the contrary, disease possesses nothing domestic, but is entirely foreign from our nature, and hence its presence is more manifest on account of its diversity. But such things as are peculiarly our own are present with us, without any manifest sensation, so that when we are in this condition, we are then most of all known to ourselves, since our science in this case is one and the same with our essence. Hence in the divine world, when we are most knowing according to intellect, we appear to be ignorant, expecting the passion of sense, which says it does not perceive, nor indeed does it see, nor can it ever attain to the intuition of such exalted objects. That which distrusts its vision, then, is sense, but it is something else which perceives. And if this too should doubt, it is no longer its true self. For neither can this last when it places itself externally, behold that which is intelligible as if it were sensible and to be seen with corporeal eyes. Thank you. Let's go back to 185, just, uh, if we could just master um, <laughs> one sentence. But it is requisite that the soul, got it? Yeah. Take a moment out for that sentence. But right. it is requisite that the soul? Right. So take a minute out and take a look at it. Got the text? Oh, okay. that, was, that was on 84? It's 185, kind of at the bottom. Okay. What are the steps? What are the steps? So you're going to become masters of that one sentence. Okay, what do you say we do it, right? Um, how many steps? How many steps? <clears throat> but it is requisite that the soul which is about to perceive a divinity, right? About to perceive a divinity, right? So here he is. That's the soul, as you can see about to perceive a divinity. Now, <clears throat> um, at least we're all familiar with the idea of God the Creator. That's Jupiter or Zeus, right? So use that as a model, God the Creator. There are differences, of course, but let's put that aside. But it's requisite that the soul which is about to perceive a divinity of this kind should possess a certain figure of his nature. Ah. Ah. You've got to work. got to possess a figure of his nature. and assiduously persevere while it endeavors perspicuously pers to know him.
So preserve while it endeavors to persecutiously to know him. And thus well understanding the importance of its pursuit. Come on, can we get them? Let's get it all down. How many steps do you find? How many? We count them. How many do you got? Okay, so you're now going to tell, Barbara, you're now going to tell mm -hmm. someone how to do it. Right? Let's all help Barbara. Okay? When the soul is about to catch a glimpse of this divinity, what's, what's presupposed? That it can possess a certain figure of its nature. Good. Second? Got to hold that on to that. Can hold. Right, it's got to... Hold on to it, right? That's right. Hold fast. Hold fast and carefully. Go ahead. Endeavoring to know it. Trying to know it. Endeavor to know it, right? That's right. Try, I like that. Working Try to hard know it. At knowing it. And, and, it, it, and it looks like in so doing, understanding uh, the importance of, of the pursuit. Wow. This is the hard one. <laughs> yeah, I understand the, the purpose of the pursuit. Yeah, the importance of the pursuit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, five? Well, this looks like that peculiar platonic or neoplatonic pistis, right? Trust. Yeah. Trusting it's about to um, enter into that blessed vision that they talked about at the beginning. It's about to proceed. Here it's um, entering into a most blessed vision. Paraphrase it. Um, Trust yourself that you can do it. Yeah. 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 Go ahead. And that what's coming is a good is a good is the thing you're looking for. Right. And so then... Hold it. Mm -hmm. um, so, that <coughs> those things, it's going to merge itself, it's going to un unite in a very deep way in the contemplation. Merge, meaning unite with whatever... Unite with that vision, I think it. Merge itself in contemplation. Yeah. I'm not sure about that. That's a very interesting. Merge itself in contemplation. You have that earlier line, too. Mm -hmm. Transferring the divine spectacle into ourselves. But anyway, so so it's not then it's not going to be a perceiver at that point. It's not a spectacle. Yeah, not a spectator, right? Yeah. But right, it's going right, to right. Be, it looks like it's going to become like a copy. I mean, in a way of manner of speaking, it's another another instance of that which it's intuiting, right? Because it says it may become another specimen of the object of its intuition. Yeah, of the object of the intuition. Yeah. Ah, ah, ah. So since we don't take specimen to be the butterfly with the pin. We're going to have to take it some other way. Yeah. The object, if you have an object of intuition, then mm -hmm. that's an immediate experience, and you're not yes. merely a spectator. Right. You're entering you're, into it. And you're becoming it. And you become it. becoming a, yeah, um, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, exemplar of it or something. Um, right? Right, how? Huh? Okay. So, that, sorry? You're going to glow. Yes, yes, yes. 
Okay. Um, it may become another spe specimen. There. Such as it came from thence. Right? Such as it came from thence. As if it uh, what, or originated in that blessed spectacle, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's going to shine with uh, intellectual... Abundantly, right, abundantly form. shining with intellectual conceptions. His, I, ideas. his idea of intellectual is not what we call intellectual, right? Exactly it's, so. Right. It archetypes, at least. But you'd say, yes, right. Yeah, I was yeah, thinking you might yeah, be on the yeah, level yeah, of yeah, idea, yeah. idea or platonic form. And that ought to be pretty light. And that ought to be pretty light. Okay. See, what we're saying is that he builds these models of contemplation and then from that experience he builds his metaphysics hmm. and then joins them because hmm. now he's giving the terms that he experiences look at the background though that he's bringing to it Ooh. Right. especially understanding the importance of it right. Then merging in a deep way in your contemplation, you're merging in deep experience of beauty itself. And beauty itself, therefore, for him is the nature of being or reality. And the intellect, right? Yeah. yeah. Intellect, of course, is the eye of the soul. Eye of the soul. I, I, basically. Yeah. And I. And, um, oh, you're right. <coughs> um, Now, we can just go back and forth and find other models of contemplation. This is another one, the second one. And then through that, one gains these experiences, puts them into words, finds the ideas necessary to explicate them and to understand them. That's the system. Rather fun. I mean, if you have nothing else to do. That's right. Right? Nothing better to do. <laughs> you like that expression? I did. I do. <laughs> um, and then analogies, okay? Um, actually, we cheated. Um, But how can anyone reside in the beautiful itself unless he perceives it? Indeed, if he, if he perceives it as something different, well, well, he will not yet abide in beauty. But becoming beautiful, he will thus especially exist in beauty. If then vision is directed to something external, it's not a proper, it's not, it's not proper, right, not proper. Or if you right, you don't want that. Uh, you want to become one with the object of your perception. Um, I think if we move down to the next paragraph, The uh, opening line is worth it. Can you do the first sentence on the next one? But, but it has been shown. No. But it has been shown how the soul may be able to accomplish this as different from its object and how when the same. That yeah. sentence? Yeah. So it, everything in... Uh, 
Everything he's going to do is going to relate to this. Whatever you experience, right? This is the object. This is the activity. This is the seer. You always know that these are always fundamentally different. He's saying here is this kind of object, there's no difference between the object and the subject. Right? So he, he wants to get you away from that. Um, but it's been shown how the soul may be able to accomplish this as different from its object, right? Mm -hmm. And how when the same? Um, now he's going to talk about Zeus or God the Creator and use the language he's developed in his theology. Try it. Now we're moving into theology. Go ahead. But what will the perceiver relate, whether abiding as different or the same? He will tell that he saw this God, who is the same with the intelligible world, generating a beautiful sun and producing all things in his essence without any labor and fatigue. Now here it comes, theology. Go ahead. For this deity, being delighted with his work and loving his progeny, continues and con connects all things with himself, pleased both with himself and with the splendors his offspring exhibit. But since all these are beautiful and those which remain within are still more beautiful, Zeus, the son of intellect alone, shines forth externally. Zeus the sun of intellect alone shines forth externally, proceeding from the splendid retreats of his father. From which last sun we may behold, as in an image, the greatness of his sire and of his brethren, whose divine ideas, who abide in occult union with their father. One more time. But since, so, let's see. I'm going to just do that one more time. Mm -hmm. um, okay. But what will the perceiver relate, whether abiding is different or the same? He will tell that he saw this God, who is the same with the intelligible world, generating a beautiful sun and producing all things in his essence without any labor and fatigue. For this deity, being delighted with his work, and loving his progeny, continues and connects all things with himself, pleased both with himself and with the splendors his offspring exhibit. But since all these are beautiful, and those which remain within are still more beautiful, Zeus, the son of intellect, alone shines forth externally, proceeding from the splendid retreats of his father, from which last son we may behold, as in an image, the greatness of his sire, and of his, breth and of his brethren, those divine ideas who abide in occult union with their father. But this ultimate progeny does not affirm in vain that he proceeds from his parent intellect, for he is another world, proceeding from this first and becoming beautiful like an image of beauty. For it is not lawful that the image of beauty and of essence should not be beautiful. Hence, he in every respect imitates his exemplar, for he possesses life and the gift of essence as a certain imitation of stable essence and life ever vigilant.
Right, you're all familiar with this, right? Zeus, or God the Creator, the Demiurgos. To create, he focuses on an idea. Since it's something he has, it exists separately, though he is in, he, it is included within himself. Therefore, uh, this is called chronos, or chronian mind. It's the whole set of all ideas for all creation in its purest form and everything that's involved in such an activity. And therefore, it all hangs together intimately, all connected together. If seen, it is a vast vision of beauty. And the Demiurgos of Zeus, Kronos happens to be his father. And therefore, that's his son. Demiurgos is the son of Kronos. That's the language he's using throughout this whole thing. And all of these references, because when Zeus then, or the Demiurgos, looks at that, contemplates that idea, he then creates the universe. Right, and he looks on it and says, oh man, that's beautiful, that's good. Right? right? Most fair and beautiful. Well, he's saying if that's true then, that reflects this pure. So the more he finds in this creation of an estimable, highly esteemed object, then the more you can attribute to the source of it. He's the worker, there's the idea, that's the product. So it takes on the model of the artist, the artist at work. Right. So it's, uh, that whole paragraph reflects the time is, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, um, Saturn is Kronos. Right, so keep that in mind as we keep going through it. So you, you know that I stopped and we skipped about... Yes, please go ahead. Did you want to skip? No, 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 go ahead. You want to read through that? Yeah. Is Mark here? Mark. Go ahead. Pass it to a, yet another reader. Make, not make him work. What do you think, Mark? The, the paragraph that starts... Saturn? You show me pick well I, I think just want I make sure I'm in the right place. Yeah. I stopped reading at um I think but it but he is not an image fabricated by art. I don't know if we need that much, but mm -hmm. that's where I stopped reading, I think. But he is not an image fabricated by art. And every image formed by nature lasts as long as its exemplar endures. Hence, they do not conceive rightly who think this world may be destroyed, that which is divine remaining in the full perfection of its essence, and thus imagine the world generated, and that its author on a certain time consulted concerning its production. Such as these indeed neither wish to understand, nor are at all acquainted with the mode of its formation and are ignorant that so long as the splendors of that divine world endure, so long will this visible universe beam from thence, and will never be destroyed since the original of each is the same. But the intelligible world always was and always will be, appellations of this kind being adopted from necessity for the purpose of conveying the conceptions of our minds. Uh -huh. Nice. Right? Kronos, therefore, who according to poetical fable is feigned bound because he always perseveres in the same divine energies of his nature, who is also reported to have delivered the government of this universe to his son Zeus, 
For it was not proper that he, having diminished his government, should follow a nature junior and posterior to himself, since he comprehends in himself the plenitude of all beauty. Kronos, I say, omitting all subordinate natures established in himself, his father, Calum, and raised himself on high as far as to this ineffable principle. He likewise established succeeding natures originated posterior to him from his son. And thus he possesses a middle situation between both through a diversity of section from that which is above him and from his abstaining from inferior concerns while he is fabled by a subordinate care to be bound in chains, thus obtaining a middle situation between his greater father and his inferior son. But since his father, Calum, is something greater than beauty, hence chronos, or intellect, is the first beauty, though soul is likewise beautiful. Yet intellect is more beautiful than soul, because soul is only its vestige, and is naturally beautiful through this, though it is far more beautiful when it beholds the perfect nature of intellect. If then the soul of the universe, that we may use words more generally known, and Aphrodite herself is beautiful, what must be? be the beauty of intellect. For if soul and Aphrodite possess this from themselves, how great must be the splendor of intellect. But if from another, from whom does soul possess the beauty as well exceeding setting, as natural to her essence? Indeed, whenever we are beautiful, we become so from the possession of our own nature alone. But we are base when we are precipitated into an inferior nature, so that we are beautiful when we know, but base when we are ignorant of ourselves. Yeah. Nice. Beauty, therefore, shines in chronos or intellect with primary splendors. But are these considerations sufficient to a knowledge of the divine world? I'm sorry. But are these considerations sufficient to a knowledge of the divine world, the intelligible place? Or must we proceed another way in this investigation? And he cuts it off here. And we did the section that follows. So next time we'll be doing porphyry, which is at 191. Okay, okay. Want to raise some points? Oh, this is often called Cronian mind. Right. has different names, depending on how it's functioning. Exemplar, paradigm, beauty itself, chronos, chronian mind, idea in the mind of God, oh, just functions differently, call it something else. Oh, okay. Go out, get, I'd like you to go now, get back on your skateboards and go around the block three or four times. What about, oh, but if you Hold have it. any donations you want to give, um, see, Money. Me, see me. Money bags. Does anybody else want me to order this book for them, this domestic, domestic? Yeah. Yeah. Phil? Julie? Got a couple, three. Phil, Julie, and... Um. Bob. 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 Mm. Oh, good, thanks.
Okay, then. Thank you. A lot of fun. Thank you. I don't want to read that. I heard, I heard when I came in, I heard you, Amy, reading that section of Plotinus on how to make yourself beautiful. Capable, beautiful. And, and you want her to read it. Good yes, idea. I do. I yeah, do. yeah, yeah. Okay. I'm willing to volunteer her work. <laughs> Okay, good. Could you? Sure. Thank you. <clears throat> so this is the ninth point on beauty. And it begins... Page. Uh, in, in the essential of Plotinus, it's page 42. Mm -hmm. It begins, What then is this inner vision? Like anyone just awakened, the soul cannot look at bright objects. It must be persuaded to look first at beautiful habits. Then the works of beauty produce not by craftsman's skill, but by the virtue of men known for their goodness. Then the souls of those who achieve beautiful deeds. How can one see the beauty of a good soul? Withdraw into yourself and look. If you do not as yet see beauty within you, do as does the sculptor of a statue that is to be beautified. He cuts away here, he smooths it there, he makes this line lighter, this other one pure, until he disengages beautiful lineaments in the marble. Do you this too. Cut away all that is excessive. Straighten out all that is crooked. Bring light to all that is overcast labor to make all one radiance of beauty. Never cease working at the statue until there shines out upon you from it the divine sheen of virtue, until you see perfect goodness firmly established in stainless shrine. Have you become like this? Do you see yourself abiding within yourself in pure solitude? Does nothing now remain to shatter that interior unity, nor anything external cling to your authentic self? Are you entirely that sole true light which is not contained by space, not confined to any circumscribed form, not diffused <coughs> as something without term, but ever unmeasurable as something greater than all measure and something more than all quantity? Do you see yourself in this state? Then you have become vision itself. Be of good heart. Remaining here, you have ascended aloft. You need a guide no longer. Strain and see. Mm -hmm. Again, it's another yoga. Right? <laughs> That's the way he plays. Right? Do your homework, have an experience, come back and talk about it. Build a philosophy around it. Right? Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you.